Atkin, what an amazing, amazing privilege to sit with you and, and just have a chat about who Tim Atkin really is because we all know you as the guy who, who judge our wines and give us scores and all these things, but we don't really know who you are. So uh, let's kick off and, and, and tell me, why are you such a good friend of South African wine? Where did it all start for, for Tim Atkin? I mean, with South Africa, the first time I went to South Africa, I think it was 1990. Um, so it was, it was before uh, the elections. I think it was the year. Was Mandela released in 89 or 90? I, was, I forget. Yeah, it's, just, it's around about 90. I was still in the army. I did army 89 yeah, and 90. I think it was released in was sort of February 1990. And I think I went, I went later that year. And I'd always said before that I didn't want to go, actually. And I was quite opposed to, to, to apartheid. And I sort of demonstrated against it. Um, and then I went to South Africa that year. And, you know, I had some very honest conversations with people and I'd had them in the UK before that. And I just really liked the country. I mean, you know, I think that it's, it's, it's incredibly diverse, I think, uh, in all sorts of ways, not just linguistically, but socially and politically. I love the landscape, of course. I mean, who could not fall in love with the Cape? And I just started to think, this is really interesting. Uh, and I slowly got more and more interested in the wines. And then some people will know this, but I'm also married to a South African, although I wasn't married to a South African then. Uh, I didn't get married until 2009. And I started doing my report um, a little after that. I can't remember when the first one was actually, about 2012, I think. Um, but, but my wife, Sue, was not really connected to it. I mean, I think it's just given me a, an extra layer, if you like, of, of meaning and relationships within the country. You know, my father-in-law still lives there. Uh, my sister-in-law lives there. And I have friends through my family, but also many wine friends. I mean, of whom obviously you're one and, and rugby friends and, and food friends. And, um, you know, the more you go back to these places, the more people become part of your, your extended circle of friends, really. So South Africa feels like a kind of second home for me, really. Well, that's, that's good to hear, Tim, because uh, I, was, uh, I often think about you guys, you know, it's a 12 hour flight. We have to go to Europe to sell our wines. <laughs> But you don't really have to come to South Africa to write or, or drink wines. I mean, you can hop on a boat and uh, an hour or two later, if you're on a plane, you're in incredible wine regions. Yet you make the trip at least twice a year. And you've been doing it for many years. And you spend an incredible amount of time in South Africa. So there's got to be something that says, you know, skip France, Italy, Spain. And I know you speak Spanish and you speak French. Uh, you speak a bit of Afrikaans. Uh, not a lot. <laughs> I can sort of, funnily enough, I've kind of picked, I'm a reasonably good linguist, so I've picked it up over the years, a, l a little bit, you know, by a and things like that. I'm not going to ask I mean, you to... I, can, I, I think it's good enough to know if people are talking about me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There are a couple no, of very really. good Afrikaans words you can use around rugby, but we'll get to that later, because I know you're passionate about sport and rugby as well. But yeah. uh, I want to I go back to your first trip. Uh, what do you remember from your first trip? Uh, obviously, having this perspective, uh, perception about South Africa and actually being an anti-apartheid activist and then coming yeah. to South Africa and, and uh, if, if you blanket uh, like a lot of people do then all whites are you know supporting apartheid and all blacks yeah. are oppressed and so you come to South Africa are they are there moments that stand out that you still remember you know these wow they're not all like we thought they are yeah I mean, I, I, to be honest I never thought that and, and then I don't I'd, I'd engaged with South Africans particularly Tim Hamilton Russell who was the yes. father of Anthony Hamilton Russell who'd done a lot of good work in the UK um, and my you know talking to journalists really about me like me I was working on The Guardian then which is a left of centre newspaper I wouldn't say I was an activist you know I mean I was you know loosely uh, I, was, I, was, I was saying an activist I wasn't heavily involved in the struggle or anything um but i think that you know it, it, it i already knew that it was a more complex position um maybe not morally but certainly politically and economically and, and historically um than it was sometimes presented i mean so i think it was very interesting to go there and talk to people and you know one thing about being a journalist is that i think if you're a, a reasonably good journalist you understand that it's better to ask questions and shut up than give your own opinion you know because you learn stuff from people that way even people you don't agree with. You know, and I remember a, a very memorable visit to the KWV, which in the KWV had, had a very bad press in the UK, and a lunch at Laborie where, you know, I talked to these people about, about the people who were running it in those days, um, about the business and, and, and about the society they were living in. And, you know, they all accepted it. It, it, it certainly had had faults. 
but which society does not have faults? I mean, that's not excusing what had happened, obviously. No. Um, and I think that many of those things were, 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 were inexcusable. But, you know, I, I just think it, it made me realise that South Africa is a very complex place. I also, I think it was on my first visit, met Alistair Sparks, uh, who was a veteran South African journalist and through the Platters, actually. So I think I met the Platters, I, if not on my first trip, then on my second, um, because I was treating South Africa as much uh, as you know as a, from a journalistic point of view as a wine point of view and I wanted to get under the, the skin of South Africa so I read his book The Mind of South Africa yeah. uh, I was lucky enough to spend some time I interviewed him for a couple of hours and to get to know the platters a little bit because they're also journalists who write about wine and I've always thought that this distinction where people say oh you know wine and politics don't mix I think is rubbish because wine is you know especially you see what's happening in South Africa at the moment wine and oh, politics are, are intertwined mix. and they are in many countries and I, and I think that it was interesting to get under the skin of of, uh, of what was, as it were, you know, of what was going on in South Africa and to read a little bit behind it. And, you know, and I talked to people like Michael Fridjon, who was obviously very knowledgeable as well about the history of South African wine. You know, it, it's always fascinating me. And I, I think the history, obviously not just the history of what happened after 1948, but, you know, it's an old wine wine producing country in the new world. It's not as old as Chile or Argentina, but it's much older than... Than, than Australia or New Zealand. Um, and I found that fascinating, the history of it, you know, what the Brits had done, again, not always great. Um, you know, what the Dutch were doing there, the whole thing, the history behind the Great Trek, uh, behind the Boer War. Um, you know, on one trip, I, I, I went to the battlefield at San Luana uh, to see, you know, what had happened during the Zulu Wars, um, and that historic battle of Rourke's Drift. So, I mean, I've always looked at South Africa, not just as a wine producing country, but, but as a country that, that I'm, I'm very interested in, you know. And so that's, I hope in my reports always comes through. It's not just a bunch of scores and a bunch of tasting notes. You know, there's a, I hope, a context to what I'm writing about. Yeah, I, I love your reports, Tim, because you do delve into more than just the wine and uh, with your with your background knowledge and with you know you visiting a lot of different other wine regions that have already probably gone through some stuff that we still have to go through, it's always yeah. great to to hear your insights and your sort of forecast of what what should be focused on and what needs to be changed and and you know I'll touch on the reports later but you're not scared to say what you think is right and 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 that I, I see on your Twitter account you also also say that you're sometimes controversial. And I mean, I think a journalist need to be controversial sometimes, not for the sake of being controversial, but for the yeah. sake of, of opening up the discussion, because through discussion, you will end up uh, finding out what's right and what's not right. Um, I know you love politics. I follow you on Twitter and I saw you were very uh, outspoken on, on Brexit. Uh, and, and I'm too stupid to even understand which is the right side and the wrong side. So, so we're not going to go there. But you're also in your report not afraid to touch on the ANC and, and the successes they've had, but also the challenges that they should be addressing and facing. In your opinion, uh, what do you think, obviously, take, maybe taking out COVID now, because that's a whole different yeah. ballgame. Um, you know, we don't get a lot of support from our government as an industry, and, and the industry supplies uh, a lot of uh, income to the government and also creates a massive amount of jobs. And, and we just feel from, if you look at other countries, they get a lot of support. It feels like we're not getting that support from, from our government. Uh, I think that's true. Yeah. yeah. Certainly not enough. And I think, there, you know, there are a number of reasons for that. One is that it's, it's wine is perceived as a, as a, as a Western Cape thing um, and therefore is associated with the DA. Um, I think it's sometimes, again, I think wrongly, regarded as a white industry. Um, I think there's a little bit, although I couldn't, you know, I don't know for certain, of political motivation behind what's gone on with some of the alcohol bans. But the other thing I would say, you know, for all the corruption and, and the misbehaviour of, of the ANC and, uh, you know, it's not, not been... Uh, always a successful government. Uh, you know, I, I think anybody dealing with COVID um, who's in government at the moment, you wouldn't wish that on your worst enemy. I mean, you know, the, any decision you make is the wrong decision. Yeah. And everybody's trying to balance, you know, economic arguments against health ones. And, you know, how many people um, are going to die um, if you open up the economy, being blunt about it? And, you know, it's a decision, thank God, we don't have to make. Yeah. So I'm not excusing... Uh, this latest alcohol ban or what's gone on before, which I think were very badly handled. But, you know, I, I, I do think it's true that, you know, the wine industry um, is, is, will, I think, get through this. Um, but I think a lot of people won't. 
you know, and it's, it's very, very serious. I think it's the most serious thing. I said this in my report, probably since phylloxera, although phylloxera wasn't such a big deal in South Africa because it got there later, but maybe, you know, sort of oidium or something like that. I mean, some of these things, that these vineyard diseases, it's been absolutely terrible for the industry. And, and you know, I do think that the government in South Africa needs to find some way of supporting an industry which is vital to the economy of the Western Cape. You know, and, and more than that, I think it's a big, big, big part of brand South Africa. You know, I think if rugby is part of brand South Africa, which I think it is, um, and the people are part of brand South Africa and, and, the, and the music uh, and the landscape and all sorts of very positive things, but wine and the wine farms are a huge bit of that. They really are. That You know, you talk to people about South Africa, and I think if you played a word association game, with a lot of people, wine would come pretty pretty high up the list. You know, I would certainly be in the top five for a lot of people if you said, South Africa, what do you think of it? And yeah. positive things. I don't mean negative things. Uh, I mean positive things that you can think of about South Africa. And people might say, I don't know, game parks or that's not you know, necessarily positive for me. I'm not that interested in game parks, but some people are. But, you know, landscape, music, I think wine and food would be up there, and wine farms. Uh, and I really think that sacrificing those or losing a lot of them will damage brand South Africa. Yeah, yeah I think uh, you've mentioned, so you've touched on something, uh, game parks. I mean, I think such a big thing of people visiting the game parks uh, includes the food and wine that you enjoy on those. Yeah. On the, so if you take away the wine out of the game uh, experience, yeah. Or if you yeah. take wine out of the wine tour or the tourism experience, which includes the fine dining. And I think we've made great strides forward uh, in the last 20 years when it comes to our cuisine. Um, Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and you take it's wine out of that. It's, it's, yeah. it's just you lose so much. So, yeah. so that's been the tough thing uh, for us because we know our wine tourism has, has really tourism has really picked up in the last couple of years. And there's been a lot of investment, time and yeah. effort. And, and people like you guys, you know, you've got a, a Twitter platform, you've got Instagram, you travel the world. And I'm yeah. sure when you're sitting in Italy and you're sitting in Spain, every now and again, something reminds you of, oh, this reminds me of something I did in South Africa. So I see you as a brand ambassador for South African wine, as I do Richard Siddle, Jamie Good, Jancis Robinson. Yeah. There are so many names, you know, Neil Martin. They're all brand ambassadors because they've invested so much time and effort to come to this country. and 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 you guys have done an incredible job and thank you for that. And, and even now during COVID, when we were about no. exports, uh, you guys went onto your platforms and you ju guys just shouted, you know, help the South Africans. They need your support now, which is, yeah. uh, we're so grateful for that. And the people are talking about it. So, yeah. so thanks for that. Um, if I can take you back to your first. No, the one, one thing I want to just one. One thing I'd like to add, if I may, and I just think this thing about being a brand ambassador, I don't quite, I don't particularly like the term because it means that I'm uncritical. I think I like to think of myself as an honest friend of South Africa. Do you know what I mean? Like your good friends will say to you, do you know, sometimes you're being a bit of a prick, you know, and then you sort of say, oh, okay, or you shouldn't have said that. I don't have any friends that say that to me. Yeah, <laughs> I have. I think so, I've got one now. <laughs> yeah, no, I think in a way, and I think, I, you know, I think it's important that, and it doesn't always make me popular with some people who think, you know, you should be more positive or you shouldn't say critical things. Yeah. But I think an important per, part of being a, a friend of South Africa, and I am in many ways, I, you know, I like the country. Yeah, like a friend of friends, South Africa. Yeah, is, is to be... Is, is to be honest about what you see as its faults. And, you know, sometimes that means you give, you know, bad reviews to wines, even made by friends of yours. You know, you just say you could have done better. Yeah. Uh, one, of, one of my questions and on my notes when I thought about stuff to ask you is, you know, it's very hard to, to interact and, and stay over and spend time in South Africa with all these producers. And I know when I talk about producers, I talk not only about winemakers. I talk about wine farm owners and guys like uh, Wimbasi, you know, wine uh, growers. I, you, you really love the growers, the people who are putting their fingers in the soil. Guys like Jan Bulan Kutsio is not a winemaker anymore. He's a grower. He's a, a, yeah. an icon and you spend time with him. And then you have to crit their wines and then you have to be, as you said, honest. How do you, how do you do that? How do you keep the, you know, the, the honesty? Well, I, I think by not feeling as if you owe them anything, really. I mean, you know, and, and I, think, I think if you're honest with people and they don't think you're doing favours for your friends, um, 
you know, then I think, I hope people respect you. I mean, you know, I, I, people always say to me, oh, you know, you're nicer about people who buy stickers, you know, from your report or something. They don't buy them from me, but they buy them from my representative. Complete rubbish, honestly. I, I've, I've never, in my, you know, every tasting I enter, I mean, obviously I go in there with, with knowledge of what I've tasted before, um, you know, and I might have a, a more positive opinion of one producer than I do of another, just based on what I've tasted before. But every time I go in there, I try to go in there with a, you know, with a blank slate, not a blank mind, but a, a blank slate as far as tasting is concerned and be honest with people. And also, you know, if I'm in, in a tasting with somebody and somebody says, what do you think? Then I tend to say, I mean, not, not in a rude way. I wouldn't say, you know, this is the worst wine you've ever made or, you know, have you thought about trying a different career or something like that? But I might say, you know, um, you know, have you changed the regime here or, you know, where do you get the oak from or, you know, did you, when did you pick this or, um, you know, are you sure that was the right blend or I'm just finding the tannins a bit angular. I, I think if people, I think the worst thing you can do to say to somebody, God, this is fantastic. And then you go away and the review comes out and they see it's got 83 points and they think, shit, what happened there? You know, the guy's lying to me. Yeah. I, I think if you're if you're upfront with people, they might not like it always. Yeah. But I don't really want to be liked necessarily. I want people to respect me and say, okay, I may not always agree with his opinion, but I know it's his opinion. I know it's arrived at honestly, and he's doing his best. And also, the 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 opinion is based on experience and knowledge, and you hope a degree of tasting ability, but also in, in enough commitment to spend time in a country and understand it. Um, for all the reasons we've talked about at the beginning of the interview, but also, you know, to go back every year um, and, and taste the wine so you know where, where they've come from and then you ask them about where they're going towards. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, you know, having that full understanding, you know, I've just, while we were doing, I'm not good at math, but I figured out that you've spent over 30 years of traveling to South Africa since your first trip. Uh, yeah, sadly, you right. couldn't get out to South Africa last year. You weren't here once. Um, how in your mind, uh, and there are two things I want to touch on. The one is the wine making and, and the wines. And the other one is the, vine the, the, the vineyard side, you know, the viticulture. Because I know you, you, know, you speak a lot with uh, people like Rosa Creer and, and guys like Chris Arlight and, and Ibn Saadi. They, in my, in my mind, they, as, and Johan Reineke, as much, you know, viticulturists as they are winemakers. So yeah. on, on those two points, wine making and then uh, growing grapes, what in your mind has changed the most over the last 30 years? I mean, complete revolution in the South African wine industry. And it's obviously it's come um, firstly from the vineyard, that without the vineyards, and without the grapes, you can't do it. And I think that, that the, the sites in many cases were there. Um, they were not necessarily being exploited to their full potential. I think that's the first thing. And a lot of those people you've mentioned um, who are who are great growers or, or, or viticulturists or consultants in the sense that Rosa is in a way have done an enormous amount for South Africa. I think that's one thing. I think winemaking too has, has developed a lot. Um, you've gone away. I think you, it's, you've gone away from thinking you need to make wines like somebody else did. That used to be this thing about oh we're we you know we're the new world's answer to the old world. You need to. Um, and then it was, oh, hang on, we need to make wines that are more like Australia's making, you know, because they're very successful. So let's make wines with more oak and more alcohol that we pick much later and we've got 14% alcohol. And now I think we're almost in a, in a third phase um, in the time that I've been writing about South Africa, you know, those, those um, 30 years really, um, where people are now saying, let's make the wines that we want to make that reflect our values that reflect our winemaking style. Uh, and I think that's happened a lot. The, the, the other very important factor I think is that because grapes are cheap in South Africa to buy um, and land, vineyard land is not particularly expensive and it might be in bits of Stellenbosch, but that's more because of real estate than because of the value of the land as vineyard land. It's been comparatively easy for people to get into the wine industry. So the Chris Alheights of this world, you know, you can think of 30 young producers um, who got into the industry by buying grapes or you know from other growers or in some cases buying vineyards and it's not you know the barrier of the hurdle if you like to entry it's not that high yeah. and that's been a very positive thing in some senses that almost anybody can become a winemaker you just got to sell the wine after you've got into the industry but I think that's been very positive and if you look at the list of what I think are the best producers in the country and you know I think there's a degree of agreement both from South African wine journalists and also from overseas ones, not on everyone, but broadly speaking, a lot of those are post 
1990 businesses really you know they've, they've come out of that greater freedom and i think one of a big big bit of that was the ability for south african winemakers to travel that uh, before 1990 when giles webb once said to me you know we were the skunks of the world you know and nobody wanted a south african in their wine cellar not quite that bad but i think there was a degree of that that south africa found it hard to export its wines because of sanctions and other things and i think it's it, it you know there was suddenly this explosion of new talent but particularly it was new talent that was going overseas. If you talk to a lot of people, you know, like Evan and Chris, uh, Al Haidt and Evan Tardy, who are both supremely talented, world-class winemakers, the time they spent overseas helped them to understand South Africa better. You know, the, 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 and I think that's true, of, that's why I travel in a way, that, you know, the, the T.S. Eliot line about, you know, you coming back in the, the beginning of something and, and knowing it as if for the first time. But if you travel overseas, you see your own country in a different, perspective a different light and, and I, I think that's a good thing for, for anybody I mean it's not a justification for endless business travel but I think that I'm sure you feel the same way that you know when you go overseas whether it be you know to Holland or or to Germany or to England or France or to Italy or Spain or the States or Australia they're they're all very different places and they 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 broaden your your experience yeah. introduce you to new people but also enable you to to focus on your own backyard in a way in a slightly different way and I think all those things have contributed to this amazing um, explosion, really, of talent in the staffing wine industry. I mean, it's, it's unlike, I think, anywhere else in the world. I mean, even other places I know well, like Argentina and Chile, they've been through a, uh, Argentina's quite similar, uh, well, Chile too, they've been through a dictatorship, um, have followed a similar path. Um, it hasn't had the sheer number of, of brilliant young winemakers that South Africa's had. Okay, that's, that's, that's very good to know. That's very positive for the future. If we can just keep them in the wine industry and if we can keep us, uh, you know, keep on uh, having a sustainable wine industry. But, you know, we've got we've got tough guys in the industry, guys like Jan Boerland and, and uh, you know, the Johan Krieges, the these guys and the Johan Malans, they've been in the in the industry for a long time. And they one thing South Africans don't do, we don't do give up. We, no, that's, that's we, don't, we don't do give up. It's very, I, I remember in, I think it was 1990, where the first election was in 94, and there was a very unstable period between Mandela's release and, and, and the first elections. And, you know, the, 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 nobody knew which way the country was going to go. And I think I was there in 1992 or three, so it was before the elections, it might even be 94. And I said to Jan Bullen, Jan Bullen, um, you know, good luck and, uh, and, and I'll see you soon. And he said, don't worry, Tim, come back soon. He said, the booze will still be here. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, well, I know you've been close friends with Jan. And, uh, oh, you know, my time, times with Jan have been some of the best times of my life. You know, I once had the chance to, to watch uh, the second test of, of the Lions against, against uh, the All Blacks when, when, uh, when uh, the All Black got sent off, or uh, the centre, I've forgotten his name. Um, uh, Sonny Ball Williams. First Sonny Ball Williams, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly, and I sat and watched that with Jan Bullock and Casilla, you know, one of the one of the great Springboks. I mean, you know, me and him drinking a bottle of bubbly when the Lions won, you know. I mean, and it was just fascinating. He's a lovely man, but he's a very cultured man. Yeah. Yeah, but also, he was a great rugby player and with a great rugby brain. And so it was fascinating to hear him talking about the, you know, about the match really, because because he reads the game. And you know, I remember saying him, you know, when the guy got sent off, I said, "Have you ever played in a team that's that's won?" You know, we're down to fourteen men, and he said, "Yeah, once." And I said, "What was it like?" And he said, "Brutal, <laughs> brutal." <laughs> but yeah, no, no, Jan, uh, I still see Jan at every Marty's rugby match in Stellenbosch. He never misses the game. Uh, but but he's such an iconic figure in the South African wine industry, and I mean, he's one of only three winemakers to make uh, the wines that you first scored 100 points, you know, Kanon yeah. Um yeah. Talk to me about that, because that was something that uh, you probably lay awake a few nights before you, <laughs> before you assigned that score. That was your 2018 report for the 2015 uh, Kanon Kop Paul Sauer. Yeah, it was, it was funny, actually, because, you know, I was, um, I won't say who it was, but I was, I was I'd just been to Kanon Kop. And, I, and, I, and we tasted the 15 vintage, which was very good. And my next visit, uh, I'll tell you who it was actually, it, it, was, it was actually Hartenberg. Uh, and I was going there the next visit and I was sitting, and Carl Schultz was there. And I like Carl. He's a very, another very cultured, intelligent, um, fantastic winemaker as well, smart guy. And we we're chatting and, 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 you know, and, he, and he's saying, where have you just been? And I said, Canon Cop. And he said, what was, the, what was the wines like? And I said, Paul Sauer was unbelievable. And, uh, and I said, do you know what? 
I'm actually, I've given it 99 points in my notes. And I said, I just wonder if I should give it 100. And he said, if you were ever going to give 100 points to any wine, no one will criticise you if it's Paul Sauer. And so I didn't say, okay, I'm going to give it 100. I thought, it just put a thought in my mind. And then when I was writing the report, I'd given it 99 and, and, and I tasted it again. And I thought, oh shit, let's go for it. You know, I mean, I, I, and I, I think sometimes it was a statement and everyone said, oh, you did this for yourself. I didn't do it for myself. You know, I had the courage to do it, yeah. but I, and, nor did I just do it exclusively for South Africa. Obviously I knew people would talk about it, but I thought the wine was amazing. And I've had the wine subsequently several occasions and it's a brilliant wine. You know, I'm not going to say I was right. I'll know I was right in 10 years time. You know, when you look back and taste it, maybe against the 2017, which I didn't give 100 points to, although it came close. Yeah. Um, I, I thought it was an important statement for South Africa. And, and you know, the, the weirdest thing of all, that most of the criticism that I got from it came from South Africa. It didn't come from people overseas. I remember Richard Hemming tasting it and saying, this is amazing. God, I'm, you know, you, he tasted it at Cape Wine. And he said, he's not the journalist, obviously, and he said, that's a brilliant wine. I'm so glad you gave it 100 points. The criticism came from mostly, I'm sad to say, other journalists in South Africa who didn't do it. He said, oh, you know, it's, we're not worth 100 points. But I think that's the wrong attitude. And South Africa sometimes has this strange combination of, of enormous self-belief uh, and yet this insecurity, you know, that, that people pretend to have this enormous self-belief. You know, we're the best in the world. But then, you, then they said, yeah, but we're not really, are we? I mean... Australians call it cultural cringe, and I've had several disagreements with, with one journalist in South Africa about this, um, you know, who, who thinks that South Africa doesn't deserve 100 points. And yet, if you're in America, where California wines routinely get 100 points, you know, they might get hundreds of them. Um, they say, yeah, we're great. We're just as good as Bordeaux. We can, you know, we're the best. Uh, and I think that's, that's an American attitude. I'm not saying it's always right. Um, but I think sometimes South Africa could do with a bit more of that. I mean, the Aussies have it. The Aussies think, yeah, we're pretty damn good. Fair, you know, um, they don't have that insecurity. They're not burdened by insecurity. Let's face it, Australians. No, um, I think, you know, I so, think so, so that was why. That's a very valid point. You know, if you if you do something back yourself, and and I mean, there's a big difference between having confidence and being arrogant. And and arrogance yes. obviously sometimes explodes in your face. But being confident for the right reasons is, is a good attribute. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think that's true of, of all of us. You know, I mean, some people said, oh, you know, arrogant behavior by me. And, and, you know, okay, if you want to perceive me as arrogant, that's absolutely fine. And people can take me as they find me. But am I self-confident? Yes, I am. It's certain things, you know, that I know I'm good at. You know, I'm a good taster. I'm a good writer. You know, I, 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 think, I think I'm good at my job. I mean, if you say to me, you know, if someone says, oh, you a scratch golfer, the answer is no, I'm not. You know, I've, I've managed to get my handicap down this year through COVID to 13, but that's well, a lot well. of hard work, you know. And, and I look at people like, you know, Ernie Els and you think, shit, you know, I mean, that's just golf from another planet. But I think people who are, who are not in the wine business outside it probably look at us and say, God, how do you taste all those wines? How do you remember all those wines? And the answer is, it's what we do every day. You know, that's our job. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, I, I I just think you know I gave another two hundred points this year, one oh, to yeah. a white wine, and to a white one, yeah. yeah, and well, Skirfberg, which is from from Barsi's site, I've been to that vineyard twice now with Rosa both times, and had a chicken pie with him and his wife Rita, and looked around the vineyard and looked at the site, and you know, it's again this this history, and you think that site is amazing, you know, people again historically have said, oh, terroir, you only find terroir in France. <coughs> why can't you find terroir in South Africa? Terroir is everywhere. Great terroirs are everywhere. And so that's why I did it this year. Again, it was a, a bit of a statement, an incredible wine. And the other one was Porcelainburg. Again, amazing site. You know, amazing site, amazing vineyard, amazing winemaker who just did something incredible. You know, and, and why, why, not, why not back people? So um, that's why I did it, really. Because uh, yeah. I think the wines are worth it. I'm certainly grateful because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it showed most of the winemakers that it's possible. You know, when, yeah. you, when you constantly fall just one point short of being really good or, or the best, it, it's also disheartening. So, so to know that we can really do that. And I mean, uh, I and a lot of South Africans, I think most South Africans really value your palate and your judgment and your honesty. And for Tim Atkin to give us 100 points and to stick your neck out and do it, well, you know, yeah. we're very appreciative of that. And Thank I think it's, it's fired up a lot of winemakers. Uh, I know Miles Mossop got really close. He got 99 points. A, a great friend of mine, I worked, I, I, I sold his wines for many years. He's, he's not an easy winemaker to work with and sell wines. 
but he's passionate, you know. He's, he's yeah, gonna... and how good is that wine? If you taste that wine, I mean, I think he only made one barrel or two barrels, but I mean, that wine is, bottles, yeah. yeah, that's stunning. You know, I hope he sold all of them at a very high price. You know, I do. For him, he deserves it. He's a great winemaker. Yeah. I want to touch on something else. You know, you're speaking about stuff that, that you're really good at and you have confidence in. The, the other one is your photography. And, and if, you, if people buy your report, uh, for me, it's so interesting to look at the winemakers you photograph every year. And I think a couple of years down the line, you know, you're going to have the, the young Miles Moss of Ibn Saadis and, and you know, Philip Costani is in the one with a, with a big moustache. And then with our, it's, it's very interesting. Where did your love for photography start? Are you, are you actually a trained photographer? No, I'm not at all. I mean, I, I, I did when, um, when I was 18, I had a year in America. I got a scholarship to go to America for six months, actually, not a year. And um, I, I studied in an American high school. I did my last half of the year in an American high school. And one of the things you could study there was photography. And I did a photography course. This was obviously way pre-digital photography. And I'd always taken a few pictures and quite liked it. And then I went on a trip to Argentina, I think it was in about 2008. Uh, and there was a guy on the trip who was um, from Wines of Argentina. He was a very keen amateur photographer. And we just got talking about it. And I thought, this is really interesting. I should do this again. And it coincided in 2010 when I started writing these reports. I thought, well, why don't I take the pictures? And if you look behind me on the wall there, there are loads of photographs, not by me, they're by, by quite famous photographers. I've always collected photography. I, so I knew what good photography looked like, right? I mean, technically I didn't know necessarily how to take the pictures, but I knew what good photography looked like. And I, I think I have a good eye. Um, and then I just kind of developed the skill really. I mean, not as well as you have, you know, where you're making a living out of it, but it's become, it's become more than a, an interest and a passion, a hobby. It's become part of what I do. And I love it. You know, I, I really like taking photos and it, it, the weird thing is, I like taking photos overseas. I don't like taking photos in England quite so much. And I think it's something about being in another place that, that inspires me to, to, to take pictures and to try to capture it and record it. And, and I particularly like taking people, pictures of people the way you do. I mean, you're very good for sports, sports over as well. But I, I find this the challenge of capturing somebody's, not just somebody's face, but their expression and something of their personality Ooh. in a picture. Is, is a really interesting thing to do. And I think a lot of it is making the person behind the lens feel relaxed about what you're doing. You know, not to think, oh God, they're gonna make me look terrible. They're gonna show both the chins, you know, they're gonna make sure, they're gonna show all the lines. Yeah, the light's gonna be terrible. Um, and I like do, doing that. You know, th th there was, um, th there's a very in interesting, uh, you know, uh, expression by, by, by Clive James, the writer, and he talked about good writing being about turning a phrase so it catches the light until it catches the light oh. and i think that a lot of photography is that understanding of of, of how you interpret light i mean I, I i don't know about you i don't like to use flash very much partly because i'm not technically good enough to do it well but i think I, i'm always looking for light and i think that when i when i arrive at a winery i haven't got long very often to take a picture i'm looking at backgrounds so i'm thinking will that person's color you know skin color or, 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 or complexion or what they're wearing work against that background or i'm sort of scouting around i mean you're doing this you just do it naturally yeah and i think the good thing about being a photographer i mean i'm not a professional like you are is that it makes you appreciate your environment more you're always looking for, for backgrounds and light and, and and contrast and shade and all those things so so i love it you know it's, it's a huge bit of what i do and it gives me enormous pleasure and now I have lessons so with, a, with a local photographer who's great. Um, I can't wait to be back in the cave and taking some pictures again. Lovely. <laughs> uh, we, we've still got this uh, commitment that I've got to take you to a rugby match uh, and we've got to do some action photography as well. I'm sure that'll happen once we can start traveling again. I, I, I would absolutely love to do that because, you know, um, I, I'm just not good enough. Well, I'm sure I can learn how you capture motion and things like that. I mean, I think all those things are, are super interesting. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Photography has changed my life and wine and photography, the, the two things mm -hmm. that for me stand out, uh, both of them uh, as the ability for me to connect with the people. So when I take a sports photograph, for yeah. me, it's all about meeting the guy behind the photo. So yeah. I've got many rugby friends, uh, you know, I photographed Andre Pollard when he was 11 years old playing barefoot rugby. And today he's a World Cup winning uh, I don't want to rub that in, but we had to get to the, to the <laughs> event, so I thought I'd use the photography. But, <laughs> you know, but, you're, but you're, very, you're very good at that. I think, you, you know, you may, 
you make people feel relaxed, you know, that, that, that you know, it, it's quite unnerving. I mean, not so much for a sports person because they're used to it, a top sports person, but, you know, if you've suddenly got this lens pointed at your face, it makes people uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that they, they need to feel that there's a, there's a human being on the other side of it, not just a machine or a, yeah. a robot. Yeah. And that's what that's that's the lovely thing about photography is it's a, it's a it's a conversation. I know that's a mixed metaphor, but you know what I mean. It's 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 it not is, just an image. It, it's it, a conversation. It, it, it's a conversation with a lens, it's and it's a way. conversation between people. It's a two way thing. It's an interpretation, really. And, and I, I, you know, uh, that's what I love about it. That it's it's you know, you, I mean, that's what. I'm, so I'm not particularly good at landscapes because I don't have the patience to sit there for hours and watch that kind of slow movement of things. But also, it's harder to have a conversation with, with a landscape. I mean, it doesn't mean you can't feel moved by it or inspired by it, but you don't have that same human connection that you get with a, with a person, obviously. Um, you've deferred a, uh, away from the rugby, but I know you're a lover of rugby and you've had a lot of banter. I mean, I've actually uh, I've taken Brendan Fenter to one of your events and we've made a video yeah. together. And uh, I mean, most of the times that we connect, it's actually not about wine, it's about rugby. Uh, yeah. I think we, we had a chat about during the World Cup and everything, and, and you were very gracious in the end to congratulate me. Um, <laughs> your love for rugby, where, where does that come from? I played at school. I mean, uh, um, I played in, in my school's first team, uh, and then I went to university, and the university I went to is called Durham. And Durham is a, is a rugby university. A lot of people who've gone on to play for England, including Will Carling, who was the captain of England, uh, one of its best periods in its history, um, went to Durham. Okay. So if you went to Durham, it was almost impossible to get into the first team playing rugby because, because most of the people in the team were, were, were England players. You know, they, 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 they were England youth players yeah. who in many cases would go on to play England, England full rugby. Uh, Marcus Rose was there, uh, Will Greenwood was there, you know, wow. Carling, not all at the same time as me, obviously. but. Um, and therefore, I played soccer at, school, at university. So I played for the first 11 soccer team. Um, I'd always played soccer at weekends when I was at school on Sundays. And I played foot, rugby on a Saturday and soccer on a Sunday. Those are the days. Um, and um, so I'd always loved rugby. And I think that subsequently, I, I've always been a massive armchair fan of rugby. I've not played for years, really. But I just find there's something wonderful about the sport. I, I love its confrontational aspect. I love, I love the fact that you've got backs and forwards and how different they are. Um, different. I love the fact that anybody can play rugby in a way. People said, you know, tall people, small people, fat people. Not so much now, maybe. Um, and I've just got to know a few rugby players over the years. I mean, I've become very good friends with Brian Moore, who's a, a great England, England rugby player. Um, I don't know Will Carling personally, but I've exchanged. He's a wine lover. I, you know, I send him my Argentina report every year because he likes that. Um, you, know, I've got, you know, I've got to know a, a, a few um, a, 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 of the rugby guys and been to lots of matches. So, you know, I... I and, you know, it, it's, it's, again, it's something I have particularly in common with South Africans. I mean, through you, I met Brendan. I know Jan Bullen pretty well. Um, Scott Berger. And, yeah, it's actually Scott Berger very much. I've not met Junior, but I've met Senior, you know, with his enormous hands. <laughs> and he's great, you know. And I think rug, rugby people, you know, um, enjoy each other's company. Even if you're on different sides, you can have a beer at the end of the day. And I promise you guys that I'm going to bring some really special wines for our lunch. We're going to have a lunch or a dinner to yep. celebrate you guys beating us in the World Cup final and I'm bringing the wines. And I promise that for you. Um, and I think, I think Ken Forrest is coming. I'm not sure who else is coming, but I'm sure uh, there'll be lots of people. And, and Maria Smallsmith said that they'll be there. <laughs> okay. so you'll have to be prepared uh, to, to have a bit of banter. But now, Tim, uh, just one of the final things. Uh, I've, I've tried to keep up with your, with your shirt uh, <laughs> and I lost badly at the last uh, three wine men when, when I wore my green shirt. I actually uh, had my Springbok Feldskun on uh, and a matching shirt, but you, you just killed me because you had a suit on. I mean, you, you didn't play fair. But um, <laughs> um, I'm wearing a shirt of a brand that I'm very, very uh, crazy about, the Stelly's brand. And the owner of Stelly's, I met with him yesterday. And when, he said, when I said I'm speaking to you, he, he knows you and he enjoys your, your uh, reports on South African wine and South African wine. And he's kindly offered to send you a golf shirt. So, so that'll be on the way. Uh, it, might very not, kind. it might not be as colorful as the one you're wearing, but um, <laughs> it's on its way. And, and the Stelis brand is all about living the life you'll always remember. 
And I think you're doing that, Tim. Uh, uh, you're, you're a great, great friend of South African wine. And I'm not uh, saying uh, the wine industry, wine, which includes the people, the terroir, everything that we stand for. And I'm very appreciative of that. Uh, you're a great friend of mine. I love the banter we have every now and again. Um, you've done so much to put South African wine on the map. And for that, we'll ever, forever be grateful. And uh, thank you for your time. And look after yourself. Stay out of this virus's way so we can start traveling again and, and have that dinner together and the banter. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to it. It's been lovely to see you. Uh, thanks for your time. Great fun chatting. Thanks so much, Tim. Stay well. Cheers. Yeah.